It's a beautiful day in London. We're here in London's East End at Wilton's Music Hall, which is one of the oldest Georgian music halls still in existence in the world. They're currently showing an all-male version of Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado, and I'm about to interview the director, Sasha Regan. Let's go inside and take a look. Hi, Sasha. Thank you so much for talking to us. And we're here in the incredible inside of Wilton's Music Hall with your amazing set up behind us. Um, anyone that knows me knows that I went absolutely bonkers over HMS Pinafore last year. This year, you're back again with the all-male Mikado. So, first of all, Gilbert and Sullivan, why? Isn't this tired, old, old-fashioned? Uh, that's what most people think. And that's what you get a lot of feedback from uh, audience members saying, I thought I was going to hate it, I've been dragged along, I had a bad experience with one when, my, you know, when my granddad took me when I was young. Um, but these, I would say these are more like musicals, the way that we do them. Mm -hmm. So there's, they're fully choreographed. Most of the boys are musical theatre trained, not opera singers. Um, because, you know, back in 1880, when uh, Gilbert and Sullivan started writing, these were essentially the first ever incarnation of a musical, weren't they? Mm -hmm. So it's n I don't think it's too disrespectful not to have opera singers doing it. Because we bring them to life and hopefully we bring a new audience to see them and we don't have to just leave them on a bookshelf forever. And it's wonderful to keep them going, but also the fact that more than anything, I think people are always quite surprised about how funny it is. And that's really, really, I know from you and your productions and the way you do it, the humour is absolutely at the heart of it. Yeah, I love working on comedy. And I've got, you know, have, you've seen a few now that you have a few company members that come back each time yes. and they know the style and they know it's a mixture of you know, the physical, but also that the script, we don't change the script. The script is funny. They're really well mm -hmm. written. And, you know, they are uh, brilliant satires and nothing changes, does it? Politically. No, it, it. <laughs> so we can still laugh at the same gags because politicians are still making the same mistakes now. They were in 1880. <laughs> Indeed. And actually, because this show, that there's a potential minefield that obviously it's set in this fictional land of Titipu, which is very kind of Japanesery, and there's a huge cultural backlash going on at the moment about yeah. cultural appropriation, whether it's appropriate anymore, you know, to do the costume. So you very neatly completely sidestepped this. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't want to offend anyone, and I think we've all learned now. So what did you do to kind of get around it? So what we've decided to set it in an English countryside in the 1950s on a boys' camping trip. Because we do all male, we always have to find the extra reason for doing it with an all male cast. So, um, and the designer, Ryan, uh, who did Pinafore and is now working in Regent's Park on Carjo Fall, he, you know, we work together really easily. And so it's, we think of times and styles that we like, and, you know, where, where is a place that you would find a group of good looking young men? <laughs> we're, we're running out, Tell so we've. <laughs> the audience don't want to know. <laughs> here at Wilton's. <laughs> exactly. All right, you heard it here. Come here for that. And so you get things like you know, sort of strings of underwear across, but also they're just wearing pots and pans on their heads. Yeah. So the idea is that everything comes from the rucksack that they carry in. So there's uh, all of the um, waistcoats and um, Kitty Shaw's outfit that she's wear wears is made out of a National Trust picnic blanket that you can buy online <laughs> so that nothing should appear there that wouldn't have been on that campsite in the 50s so then when you know you discuss that with the designer at the start of the rehearsal process it then makes it really easy when you start working with the choreographer to go oh hang on a minute we can't have canes we better have sticks and we can't have top hats what would they have oh look what the pots and pans from around the fire so it's a really it then makes it easy to be imaginative and we did talk a little bit about the fact that, yeah, this was written and sort of first came out in 1885. Mm. I mean, I've also done stuff recently where we've covered a Greek tragedy, which is 3,000, 4,000 years old. And you're thinking, Ugh, this is still relevant. Like, human nature never changes. So this, actually, the show is all about, it's making fun of empire and bureaucracy. Yeah, and people having multiple jobs, with this, basically wearing the same hat for mul multiple jobs, which we've definitely seen with all of the uh, backhanders and things that have been going on in our Boris's government, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Well, the corruption. So you hand me a little bribe and uh, I'm in this department and then I'm going to be in this department and I'm going to be in that department. So anyone coming to see it can recognise that. It, it, it does feel very, very painfully relevant sometimes yeah. when you're watching it, um, but not... Like the things I've watched, there's a massive move at the moment with theatre. There's, there's this, this need to have a message, 
to go, I have something important to tell you. And my belief is that it's far better to just entertain and people will then absorb. So I don't think with any of your works you ever go in going, I'm going to tell you something you need to know. No, I always, as a director, I think I'm an audience member, so I only direct what I think I would enjoy to see. So I do it from that point of view. I think people still um, come and enjoy the satire of it, but I also think it's very important for the LGBT community okay. because I feel that I've been doing them for like 12 years now, that at some, at some point, looking around with you know my friends that we go to the theatre with a lot of the work that was uh, targeted at them might be of the lowest common denominator you know it's naked and okay and actually what is beautiful if you come and watch these whether you're gay or straight is it just happens to be two men that fall in love in the show. The audiences are very, very mixed. Really mixed. And it's all amazing. Ages. Yeah. So we get Gilbert and Sullivan fans, you get the grannies and grandpas, and we've had children in all ages, which I think is phenomenal. Because I think when we first started, we had to really rely on, you know, people that were Gilbert and Sullivan fans. And now they're bringing their grandchildren in, going, come on, come and see this. Or, uh, you know, this Gilbert and Sullivan society is closing down all the time now because it's not recruiting new members. So as we go around the country, we tend to see more young people as well from university towns because we're going to Cambridge and Bath and places like that. Yeah, so then you get younger people from those unis coming in and seeing it and going, oh, we could do that. And also I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the crazy incredible history because I didn't know this until actually I came to see your pinafore last year and I was researching and looking through the programme as well. And this incredible history of, of all-male productions actually, which makes sense, in, during, in the World War, like World War II. So I was looking, it was like Stalag 383, I think it was. Like this is a, an officer's prisoner of war camp in Germany or Bavaria where they put on Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah. Um, one of our producers had gone to an auction and came, stumbled across these albums. Wow. And they are beautifully curated, handwritten programmes, black and white photographs. And someone had kept the entire history of the productions that they put on in the officers camp I think it was all the cast names and I think they'd managed to track down a couple of the people that were in the program but the costumes that they'd made from whatever they could find in the camp and everything and I suppose the it's a different side to what is normally documented yep. about the war isn't it that you think that people may have if they were in there for a long time I imagine they had to find joy somewhere and also the sense of collaboration, because they, they actually, they had to go to the Germans and barter or ask for help with props and costumes or whatever, which was given. And then very often the Germans would come and be part of the audience as well. So it's, it's rather like we were talking about earlier, the, the, the Christmas Day football match. Mm -hmm. This incredible sense of theatre, again, bringing, giving joy to people that were in an awful situation, mm -hmm. but also bringing connections and kind of comradeship across the line, even at the height of war something crazy and kind of silly almost like Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah, I couldn't believe it when I saw the albums because the, the costumes are yeah. so ornate. Yeah. And they've got wigs, I think, as well. And you think, how on earth did they the find costumes. those? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wish I could have, they obviously had a bigger budget. <laughs> and then your background as well. I know, you know it's very much in our head is, um, is Gilbert and Sullivan just for posh people, number one? I'm not posh. Right. And it's not, and it's totally for me. By making these more like musicals, my hope would be that people feel that it's accessible because they are so ridiculous and daft and fun. And you can't... If, if new musicals were written in the same way that the songs in this show were written, there would be smash hits going on all the time because the way they construct the songs, they're brilliant. And I don't actually know a lot of people that go to the opera, sadly. Okay. I don't go to the opera. This is an operetta, so if someone comes, a little kid comes and watches this and thinks, oh, I'm going to investigate what else is out there, then I think it's, it's a really good gateway for people into theatre. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Sasha. I know you've got everybody waiting because everyone's backstage getting ready to go on tonight, so, and apparently curry afterwards with the... Yeah, the company curry tonight. Sadly, I'm not invited to. <laughs> you can curry. <laughs> no, I already know. Enough of the boys, it's all right. But... Um, it's just a joy being here, and it's, it's lovely seeing it like this, but I, I can't wait. I, you know, I urge people, 
come and see small theatre, small venues like this. It's truly, truly magical. So please, please, please support all our small theatres. Thank you. Thank you.